Luke chapter 20, verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. I've seen some of those. They come around this church too. Spies that pretend to be righteous, they come to spy on our liberty. Paul talked about people that come to spy on our liberty, you know. And there's people that watch online who spy on our liberty. I heard about a pastor who watches because some of their people got touched in our meetings, started to come to our church and started watching our services just to, and then was calling up the people that were coming to the services to criticize and warn them about what happened in the service, how it was not God and all these other things. It's, people spy on our liberty. <laughs> so they watched him, that's Jesus, and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words. Some people just listen to the messages just to see, just to find fault with you, you know. Or how they can take a, a, something you said and spoke out of context, you know. Craziness. In order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. So they were trying to set a trap for Jesus. And in one of those days they came to him and they asked him a question. Then they asked him saying, teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly. Huh. And you do not show personal favoritism. But... Teach the way of God and truth. A lot of flattery, huh? Be careful for people that come with a bunch of flattering words, you know. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So really the question is about taxes, which obviously is about money. It's not about taxes, it's about money. So is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness. That's why it's important to have that discernment in the spirit. To be led by the spirit. Because not everyone that comes with all those words that pump you up have a pure motive. You got to be careful about people that come around you that have an impure motive. That's why it's so important to stay in the fire. That's one thing that protects you. When you stay in the fire, the fire of God is going to burn off the wrong people. They won't be able to stick, stick to you. Some people will come around and try to stick to you, but you're too hot. They can't touch you. And then in order to be with you, they got to stay in the fire. And if they don't stay in the fire, they're not going to be able to stick with you. And so it's important that you stay in the fire because it'll protect you from the wrong people. That's, I'll tell you, that's one of the most important things where you got to stay in the fire because it'll protect you. Because especially when you're in ministry and the, as the ministry grows and you start to have influence, you get all these other people that come. They come around, you're trying to ride your, ride your coattails and they have impure motives and they try to use you to get ahead you know and they come with flattering words and just trying to kiss up to you but as soon as they get their own way they'll they're gone because they always have their own agenda hidden agendas so and people will come around you with hidden agendas and everyone will face that in life stay in the fire that'll protect you from the wrong people that'll try to come to, they'll try to come they'll try to to you know misuse you they'll try to take advantage of you stay in the fire amen stay in the fire he perceived their craftiness and said to them, why do you test me? So they ask him a question, right? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They ask him a question to test him. And Jesus, boom, answers with a question to test them. Why do you test me? He don't even go start to answer the question. He just says, why do you test me? <laughs> now, let's think about it. Who are they testing? Who are they testing? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Right? But who is Jesus? Who is the Son? Who is the Son? Come on. I'm looking for a specific... The Word. Thank you. He is the Word in the flesh. He is the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, where the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word took on human flesh and came and lived among us, right? He walked with us, right? So they're testing the word. Do you understand me? They're testing the word. Listen, you don't test the word. The word tests you. You don't come to the word of God with questions. Amen? Questioning the word, in other words. And trying to change the word to suit you and fit you and your agenda. Amen. You come to the Word and you, you let the Word give you the answers. 
You let the word dictate to your life. The word changes you. You don't change the word. So why do you test me or why do you test the word? You know what the word of God says. Basically is what he's saying. You know the word. These are the people who claim that to have all the authority in, and the knowledge of the word. These are the religious people coming to him who claim to know the, the law and, and you know, keep it to the T. Amen. Come on, you know the word he says. You know the, the word about giving. You know the word about tithing. You know the word about honoring authority. You know the word about being good stewards. You know the word about being faithful. You know the word about not being covetous. All the things. You know the word. You're supposed to know the word. You claim that you know the word. But I am here, the word in flesh, and you don't know me. So that means if you don't know me, you don't really know the word. You claim to know the word, but you don't. Because if you truly knew the word, you would know me. Because I am the word. And so you claim to know the word, but you don't know the word. You're full of it. Why do you test me? So the first is, why do you test me? Second, show me a denarius. He, didn't, he doesn't say a shekel, denarius, which is Roman money. Show me a denarius, which is a Roman coin, okay? And then he says, whose image and inscription does it have? Right? I mean, you look at any money, there's always somebody's picture on there, and that's somebody significant that represents the country, the nation. Right, and there's some kind of inscriptions on it, some kind of lettering, you know, what, you know, which country it belongs to, or which kind of currency it is, and what the denomination of the currency is. Right, so he says, show me the inscription on the image and the inscription on it. Show me, tell me what's written on it, and show me whose image is on it. Right, and they answered and said Caesar's. So here, if you look at Turkish money, you can say Ataturk. Ataturk, the Turkish Republic, right? So here's, and it says it's Turkish lira. This one says 50, all right? So whose image and inscription, whose image and name is written on it? Whose image is on it and whose name is written on it, Right? Then he says to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's or give unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. In other words, Caesar created that money. So Caesar's image is on it because he created it. So the creator put the image on the money and the creator wrote its name on it. Do you understand me? And to God the things that are God's. In other words, here is the bottom line question. Give to God who belongs to God, or give to God what belongs to God. Well, how can you say if a money belongs to God or not? Money is neutral. Money doesn't belong to anybody. Amen? It's the people who use the money that either belong to God or not. So here's the question. Whose image are you created in? And whose name is written on you? Is the law really written on your hearts? Is the law really inscribed on your hearts? Because if the law of God that you claim that you know and to observe was truly written in your hearts, you wouldn't even be asking me these questions. You would not even be testing me. You would be bowing down before me to worship me. You would give yourself to God. And like Paul said about the Macedonian church, they first gave themselves unto the Lord and then gave freely and willingly offerings to, the, to support the work of God. Because they first gave themselves to the Lord. When you have given yourself to the Lord, you see, tithing might be only 10% of your money, it, but it requires 100% of your heart. You can't give God 10% of your heart. It's either all or nothing. When you're giving God everything, and He has you, he owns you. Like the Bible says, you do not belong to yourself. You've been purchased with a price. You belong to God. When you realize that you don't even belong to yourself, that you don't own anything, you don't even own yourself, that He is your master. And when you have freely given yourself unto the Lord, when you are a cheerful giver, when you have cheerfully given yourself to the Lord, you trust Him with your life, you have surrendered everything to Him. When you have surrendered 100% of your life to Him, that means you've also surrendered your finances. And so giving is not even an issue anymore. 
And so what he's saying is, if, the Caesar, if Caesar demands taxes, because he is your political master, amen, and you pay him taxes so you don't go to jail, well, guess what? Nobody goes to jail for not tithing. We don't have tithe police going around checking to see if people tithe it and arrest them, take him to the house. So people get pay taxes mostly out of fear. Nobody loves paying taxes. Anybody enjoy paying taxes? No, nobody, nobody wants to pay taxes. Are you kidding me? I hate it. And we're not even tax-free, tax-exempt in this country. This is the month. We have to pay the quarterly stoppage. It's a ridiculous amount of money we pay for the two facilities. I mean, thousands of dollars could just go pay that stoppage for the rental and stuff like that, for the facility tax. We're not tax exempt in this country. We pay 20% tax, 18% sales tax. Very few countries where the churches are tax exempt. This Turkey is not one of them. In Europe, I preached in Austria. I had to pay taxes, 25% taxes for my offerings. So they did some wheeling and dealing to make most of his show as expense or whatever. So I didn't have to pay whatever. I mean, it's just crazy. The church has to pay taxes on the offerings that come in. Like, like a sales tax. It's ridiculous. It's all designed by the world system to keep the church down, to keep the church from prospering, advancing, just keep putting, you know, roadblocks in their way and just take, keep, you know, just take, keep taking resources from them and just to, you know, keep them from making progress. It's just the de- of the devil. But if you pay taxes to Caesar because Caesar's tax collectors are going to come and report you and they're going to come and arrest you or they're going to come and take your house and take your possessions by force, Amen. Nobody comes to take your tithe by force. You have to freely and willingly give it. So just as much as they did not enjoy paying taxes to Caesar, but they had to, they had the same exact attitude about tithing. Oh, we have to tithe because the law says so. And they obeyed the word of the Lord, but they did not have the spirit. They had the the word of the law, the letter of the law, but they did not have the spirit of the law, which is love. It's the law of love. That's what's written in our hearts. The Bible tells us now in the New Testament that the law is written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God's image is imprinted in our hearts. God's name is written in our hearts. Jesus has even given us his name. I mean, when we get to pray, listen, you have, you have authority to pray over finances. Call money in, in the name of Jesus. That's a privilege. People use the name of Jesus to call money in, but when the money comes in, they don't even give one cent to Jesus. And they dishonor the name. So you can't use the name for your personal gain. The name is precious. The name is holy. The name is pure. You have to use the name of Jesus. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. When you pray, when you stand and pray, Jesus says, make sure that your heart is pure, that you have forgiven, and that there's no covetousness in your heart, that there's no love of money in your heart, that you only love God, and all of your giving is done out of the love of God. You give because you love God, not because you have to. So that's why we're not under the law anymore, but we're under grace. That means under grace, we can give gracefully. Not out of necessity, not out of obligation, but we give out of grace. To whom much is given, much is expected. Freely you have received, freely give. You have received salvation freely. You have received all of God's blessings upon your life freely. So whatever blessing comes to your life, give back freely and generously, cheerfully. And because you know that God's image is written in your heart, God's name is written in your heart, and you belong to Him. So when you have given yourself to the Lord, and your 100% of your heart is the Lord's, then giving your tithe, giving offerings, giving your money is not even a big deal. You can give 100% of your money because you've given everything already. You know that he owns everything, not just 10%. Just like the woman who brought the alabaster box of perfume and broke that box. Notice the Bible says she broke the box. That was also an expensive box. When you break something, you cannot put it back together. She broke the box. Actually, she broke the seal. Because they would seal the perfume. So the, the perfume would be sealed inside this special type of alabaster, which is kind of a, a stone, really. So... It was a kind of a, a, a special box, special container for the perfume that was sealed. She broke the seal and she poured out the perfume, which was worth what? 300 denarius or denarii. 
denarius, one denarii. 300 denarii. One denarii or one denarius was one day's income, one day's wages for a, for a laborer, common laborer. So it's almost 300 denarii. That's one year's income. She gave one year's income. So she wasn't sitting there calculating the tithe at all. She was just saying, you know, forget the tithe. That's like little. I got to give him everything because he gave me back my life. Her life was a mess. She was demon possessed and the Lord Jesus had set her free from demons, gave her life back to her. And so she's like, the life that I have now, it's a gift. So I'm going give, to give everything and pour it back out. So she was pouring out her love and worship and adoration as she was pouring out the perfume. And the perfume, the smell of the fragrance filled the whole room. Amen. And our offerings that are giving freely, willingly, cheerfully, out of grace and out of love, have a beautiful smell before the Lord. A sweet smelling aroma before the Lord. A sacrificial offering has a beautiful smell to the Lord. When your heart is broken, you see your heart has to be broken just like the box of alabaster was broken for the perfume to be poured out your heart has to be broken for your worship to be poured out David said Lord you desire a broken and a contrite heart so when your heart is broken people that have a hard heart they don't worship they don't give but when your heart is broken you pour out you pour out you pour out you pour out when your heart is broken amen so our giving is our outpouring of love worship adoration appreciation to the lord for all the things that he's done in our lives and if you truly know the word and the word knows you and the word tests you that's what the bible says the word of god is sharper than a two-edged sword right dividing asunder the spirit and the soul and then what it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart the word tests your heart when the word comes, Jesus spoke the word. What he spoke began to test their hearts. Their hearts were corrupt. Their hearts were corrupt. They loved money. They didn't want to give. They didn't want to really serve God. And they were only giving taxes out of obligation. And they were tithing, but they were tithing out of obligation. And even when they were tithing, they were making all kinds of different rules and regulations for the tithe. They called it korban, which is a sacrifice given to their parents and things like that. So they were doing all kinds of weird stuff. Strain a gnat and swallow a camel. So they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people. How can you catch God in his words? How can you ever test God's word and catch him? Catch him to be unfaithful to his word. Catch him. Say, God, I got you now. See, I got you. I saw your word. I got you now. No, no, no. You don't do what you said. No. You'll never catch God, man. You'll never catch the word. You'll never be able to point a finger at God and say, Lord, you never did what you promised you would do. You'll never find ever a loophole in the word of God or an inconsistency. There's people that look in the Bible just to find inconsistencies. We get questions all the time. I was looking at this and that, and then I found that an inconsistency answered. I don't even bother answering those questions. Because they don't really want to know. I don't even bother with that. I don't even. Well, it says in one of the Gospels that Judas fell and his gut split open. And the other one said he broke his neck. Whatever. I mean, who cares? I mean, the, the, the dude died and went to hell. Just get, don't you get it? Don't you get it? How he died? The bottom line is he went to hell. Do you want to go to hell? Whatever. I mean, just people will all. Was it a young donkey or a young colt? Who cares? He rode on an animal. The bottom line is who was on it. Not what he was on. What are you on? You're on something. You're smoking some bad religious weed. So get off the weed. Get on the Holy Ghost. Jesus, help me. These people they want to always argue and test you. Most of the time, they ask questions not because they want to learn, because they want to argue. And they want to argue their own point. And don't ever get into arguments with people who just want to argue their religious viewpoint. It'll never go anywhere. You'll end up in strife just 
Just say, God bless you. I'm gonna, I choose to walk in love and I love you. And you might have to love them from a distance as you walk away. And that's okay. Jesus walked away many times. Amen. Amen. And they marveled at his answer and kept silent. So sometimes you'll be in a situation where people come to test you. Just pray for wisdom. I mean, Holy Ghost, something will pop up from your spirit and you'll give an answer by the Holy Ghost and they'll just shock them. And they won't have any, anything to say. You'll disarm them, you know. So, amen. So giving is never about money. Just as taxing, taxation is never really about money. It's about always an intent. What is the intent behind the taxes? Why is it that people try to avoid taxes? It all comes down to agendas, you know. The whole global warming thing, it's a scam, it's a hoax. It's false science that's been doctored up. Now there are a lot of other scientists coming out talking about it. And people have lost their jobs and things like that. They've been ostracized because it's almost like, it's almost like taboo to even say now the global warming is a hoax. Well, I will just say right now, global warming is a hoax. It's fake science, fake news. Okay, I just said it. You know why? The whole thing was about global control. Because anything with a global in front of it, you've got to be concerned about anyways. But the moment you say it's global, climate change, no. I read my Bible. As long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time, harvest time, summer, winter, cold, and hot. That's it. I'm done. It's over for me, bro. I don't care about any scientists. Anyways, it's, it's all doctored up. It wasn't even science anyways. It was all political misinformation designed to push an agenda, which is a carbon tax. Did you know that? It's about petroleum. It's about basic. It's about all this energy. It's about, it's, it's about money. It's about money with the elite controlling it. And now they're saying that you are causing global warming because you breathe in oxygen and you breathe out carbon dioxide. So you, my friend, are polluting the environment. You are a problem. And that's what they're saying now. That's what they're saying. That's what they say. Humans are a problem. And there are too many of them. Let's kill them. And now they talk about eugenics, which is population control. And now they want to reduce the world's population to 500 million people. You go up on YouTube, pull it up. You'll, you'll find Ted Turner, founder of CNN, talking about it on his own network, talking about how we need to reduce the world's population to 500 million people. What is that? It's global agenda of the Antichrist to kill, steal, and destroy. It's just about control. It's just about fear. So creating fear. Everybody's running. All these liberal idiot snowflakes running around. Oh, the global warming. The ice caps are going to melt. We're going to die. We're going to die. Okay, when... when if you were to die this very second, where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? Because I know where I'm going. Let the ice caps melt. I don't really care. I don't want to live here in it anyways. I want to go where there is no ice. You know there's no ice in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. No snow. I don't like snow. Thank you, Jesus. You don't like snow. Snow really got you badly. The guy comes from the deserts of Iraq, first snow. He goes, boom, busts his head open. It's not like walking on sand. you got to be careful. <laughs> You're just sitting in the wrong seat today. I'm picking on you. <laughs> no, humans are not the problem. The devil is the problem. God loves people. He sent his son to die for them. Yes, humans need to be saved and redeemed from the evil nature. Amen. Amen. But the devil hates people and that's why he's always attacking them and trying to demean them and put them down and destroy them and kill them and steal from them. Amen. Amen. So giving is never about money. It's always about the heart. When God has your heart, he has your money. He has your time. He has your talents. Amen. Yeah, giving is, giving is tithing. Tithing is not about, about any of that. Tithing is about it's about commitment. The people that tithe to the church are the people that are connected to the church. And then we have people that come, they sit here for years, they never tithe. And they never come to a, a membership class. And, or they come to the membership class and they see the part about tithing. And then they, they don't even fill out an application. We've had that too. They, they, say, they just go, can I come as a guest? Well, do you want to be a guest in heaven? How long would you like to stay? Come for a week? check in for a week and check out do you want to be a permanent resident in heaven I want to be a permanent resident in heaven I want to be a permanent resident of the local church I'm connected I give my life I give my blood sweat and tears and I have given some blood to this church 
I've given a lot of tears. I've given a lot of sweat. Amen. Many of us have. Amen. Remember that one time I sliced my finger open? The guys were like, literally blood was pouring out in the studio. We're moving something. And the guys are standing and I'm looking at this thing. Like literally, like blood just squirting out. So I've given some blood too. (laughs) Amen. And there are others that gave a lot of blood. A lot of blood. April uh, 18th. Can you believe it? Ten year anniversary of the Malatya massacre where they murdered those three Christian brothers, a pastor, evangelist, and a German missionary. They cut their throats open. And it'll be 10 years. Can you believe that? 10 years. March 15th was 10 years. 10 year anniversary of me going on television. 2007. It's been 10 years. Can you believe that? And the murderers are still walking. And people are upset they didn't get justice. Look, man. You're looking for justice from the world system. Uh, you wait a long time. There's going to be a lot of injustice on this side. You better just learn to for, for, forgive and forget and move on. And just leave it in the hands of God. He'll, ta- he'll settle accounts, trust me. Oh, yes. He, and he'll do a very good job of that. Much better than what you want. So forgive and move on. And just focus. But people have given their blood. Jesus gave his blood. Every drop of it for us. He gave his sweat and blood and life because he loved us. So if he can do so much because he loves us, then what is tithing? What is giving offerings? What's giving another 10% or 20% or 30%? It's nothing. It's nothing. It's just money. It's just temporary. But make sure that money does not have your heart, that God has your heart. You cannot serve two masters, right? So we love him and we worship him in our giving and we're not going to argue with the word listen to me if god says to me i want 90 percent and you want, you live on 10 percent, i'll do it if that's what he said and he didn't even say that but if that's what he said yes i trust him the bible says jonah swallowed the whale i believe that too but he says but the whale swallowed jonah so i'm okay with that <laughs> well how how was he in the whale's belly for three days and three nights well he actually went down the Sheol that's what the Bible says so he actually died and God resurrected him when the 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 fish spit him out and that's a bad thing for when you're disobedient prophet bad things happen to you so you better be an obedient prophet don't be when you're disobedient God says go to Nineveh you get on a ship to go to Tarshish the opposite direction you're in trouble buddy so And don't blame God (laughs) for what happens to you because you may something might swallow you on the way a a giant jellyfish might come out of the ocean I don't know anything can happen and it probably will you better make sure that you obey that's all I know and I know what happens when you disobey too been there done there done that bought the t-shirt and sold a few Amen. Obedience is the key to the breakthrough. (laughs) Obedience is the key to giving. (laughs) And we love him because he first loved us. So we give to him because he first gave to us. And if God freely gave us his son with him, through him, will he not freely give us all things? All things. Who needs all things here? Come on, you need something, right? It's a part of that all things. Who needs something here? Because it's all, he's going to freely give you all those things that you need. Don't even worry about it. Just trust the Lord, worship him, bless him. Be a good steward, walk in love. Be a cheerful giver. Amen. Love God, love the brethren, love the sistren. Amen. Love one another. That's what Jesus said. That's how they will know that we are his disciples, if we love one another. Amen. (laughs) Love your pastors, love your ushers, love the camera people, love the, love the smallest of all. What you do unto the littlest one, you've done unto Jesus, amen. Give, give, amen. Be a blessing. Thank you, Jesus. 
Let me leave these words with you. You don't give because I'm here. And you don't stop giving because I'm not here. That has absolutely nothing to do with it. And one of the things I've appreciated, some of the biggest offerings have been when I'm not, I was not here. I like that. I always pray, Lord, let the biggest offerings be when I'm not here. Sometimes, you know, I, I traveled in the earlier days. I would travel, you know, to go out and to preach. And, you know, that's when I had kind of the mentality, you know, that, well, you know, I, I got to preach so offerings can come in and people can support the ministry. That's how we run it and things like that. Then the Lord spoke to me one day. He says, don't you trust me to take care of the ministry? Do you feel like you have to work? Let me work one time. So I actually went one pray, place. I expected a really good offering. And I got like the worst offering ever. I was so upset. And that church could have given a lot. And I don't know. The, I th well, it was God. He was testing me. I like, the offering was terrible. I'm like, come on. Come on. We really need to get cameras. We need to get this, that. I mean, I'm really believing for this kind of offering. Look at what I got. I was so upset. And that Sunday... I don't remember, but I don't remember how the offering even went, but it was like, here the offering, like, I mean, I don't even know how it went. It wasn't like one of those great messages that really just got everybody running up and throwing everything, you know, and stripping and all that, you know. It was like probably very simple, probably wasn't even much time spent on it. We had like the largest offering in the history of the church that Sunday. And we actually bought the camera from the offering that came in here. Yeah. And, and the other stuff, whatever it was, I don't even remember. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. And so, you know, you don't, don't even go by what you see. The Lord will take care of it. So I'm glad I was not here. So I could not take credit for my great preaching. Because it's not my great preaching that brings in the offerings. And I preach well. But, you know. But... But, but it, it's <laughs> I think I do a pretty good job. What do you think? Okay. But it's not the great preaching that gets the job done. It's people's hearts. You can preach, preach the greatest. Jesus preached some of the greatest messages and people walked away. Right? They were there as long as there was free fish and free bread, you know. Fish and chips. You serving fish and chips today? No, I'm just serving the bread of life. Oh, what? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Oh, come on, we're hungry, man. Give us some fish and chips. No fish and chips today. Okay, we're out of here. That's how fickle people are, really. So you can't gauge anything by that. <laughs> Amen. People are very fickle. Very fickle. We had a guy. He would not come to church if I was not here. He'd write me every week on Facebook, are you there this Sunday? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in Poland or I'm in some other place. He wouldn't show up. So he wrote me again. I, I got wise after a few times. I said, I'll be there that Sunday. He showed up. <laughs> then the following Sunday, he said, you, so you told me you were going to be there. You weren't there. I said, look, are you coming for me or are you coming for Jesus? <laughs> Crazy stuff. It's so, much, so many weird things you deal with. Amen.